Okay, so we should get this thing started. So, um, so an event of this sort doesn't happen without a lot of people to thank, and it's my job to first thank some of the people who are to be thanked. More will be thanked um, later on. And the first item of business is to thank the sponsors um, who've helped to put this event on. Um, we would like, there are a number of different, um, so there are a number of different organizations that have helped us out in various ways. So there's the Asada Business School, Mars Chocolate, North America, um, donated resources for this event. Um, think Food Group, um, the, um, the group that Jose runs, Alicia um, Ferron's um, Foundation, the Office of Faculty Development and Diversity um, from the Provost's Office. And also, and we'll get into this a little bit um, later on, um, Whole Foods donated um, all of the food for the laboratory component of the course that was the catalyst for this event. Um, and Cole Palmer, Palmer um, donated the laboratory equipment. And we're really very grateful to all of these organizations for helping us with this event. So with that, um, I want to um, introduce Evelyn Hammonds, who's the Dean of Harvard College, who will get this started. Welcome, everyone. Thank you all for coming. Um, given the packed house, oh, so let me say two things first. First, uh, I want to come out as a foodie, and, how, and I'm also a scientist, so this is like heaven for me. Uh, number two, Michael wrote a lot of my remarks, and there are some really bad jokes in them. So I want to disclaim that already. Um, and given the packed house, I think it's safe to classify you as an audience with, quote, an appetite for scholarly lectures, or is it that you're just food motivated? I told you they were bad. I, I, I own this from the very beginning. So I'm Evelyn Hammonds. I'm Dean of Harvard College. It's my pleasure this evening to ki help kick off our science and cooking lecture series. Tonight, the first of a series of lectures stems from one of our newest courses in the general education curriculum of the college, Science and Cooking from Oak Cuisine to the Science of Soft Matter. Our program in general education, and this course in particular, strives to capitalize on Harvard's strengths to develop innovative and effective teaching and learning. First, Harvard is a global convener of great minds. Professor David Weitz remarked that this course was something possible only at a place like Harvard uh, because his team created this class in more than a year and a half in academic terms, in a mere year and a half in academic terms. And this may be a real record. Moreover, when the course heads approached chefs about giving guest lectures, all of them immediately said yes. In the words of a popular food TV series on Bravo, the invited chefs instantly packed their knives. OK, there's one that worked. <laughs> um, second, Harvard is an innovator in teaching and learning. The buzz around this course has been frenetic. 700 students showed up the first day. We've had to run a lottery to bring the, course, uh, the number of students who can take this course down. But it just shows how many people were interested. Local chefs, the media, amateur cooks, and those fascinated by science and cooking called in droves to ask and often beg to attend the weekly lectures. But alas, the class is only open to Harvard undergraduates. For our students here tonight, especially those enrolled in the course, you are really the lucky ones. That said, this is a serious science course. This is not pasta for poets or eggs for economists or even souffles for sociologists. OK, all right. <laughs> While it might not be a bad thing to teach our students how to be better cooks, the aim of the course is to use food and cooking as a tool to expl explicate everything from gel-like colloids to molecular interactions, with the help of some of the world's most famous cooks. We are elevating a topic many 18 to 20-year-olds might take for granted food and turning it into a cornerstone for discovery. And finally, with tonight's event, Harvard plays one of its most important roles, Harvard as a sharer of knowledge. It heartens me to know that so many of you are here tonight so eager to learn, even without the prospect of getting free food at the end. We will have a few be beverages, however. 
I hope and I know that you will find tonight's discussion lively and enlightening, and of course, we know it will leave you hungry for more. I am now pleased to introduce Cherry Murray, who's Dean of the School of Engineering and Applied Sciences. Thank you, Evelyn. I'm Cherry Murray, Dean of the School of Engineering and Applied Sciences, and I welcome all of you and all of these 700, actually I heard it was 800 students who showed up um, to try to take this course, and I am sorry to those 400 who can't make it, and maybe we'll do it again next year. Um, before I arrived at Harvard, I, I will also say I'm also a foodie, and I'm just incredibly pleased to have you here, and the major chefs agree to do this course. It's just amazing. Um, but I never suspected that Harvard has a very long history in food and cooking and applied science. Um, Harvard is, of course, full of surprises. In 1847, um, Eben Norton Horsford showed up as professor of um, chemistry, and he took the Rumsford Professorship of Chemistry. Um, he is the person who invented baking powder. Comes to you from Harvard School of Engineering. <laughs> Um, it's called Rumsford Baking Powder because he started, it's actually true, it's still, in 1854, he started Rumsford Chemical Works, um, which produced this um, first calcium phosphate baking powder that works a whole lot better uh, than just baking soda. Um, but uh, forgive the pun, now how did Rumsford get into this? He actually gave the chair, Count Rumsford gave the chair that Horsford uh, sat in. Um, forgive the pun, but both of them rose to the occasion. <laughs> that was also written by Michael. <laughs> um, so let's see, we do uh, lots of other things, fast forwarding. I know uh, Maha Mahadevan is in the audience with his niece. Um, he actually did a paper on the Cheerio effect, which is what happens and what causes Cheerios to, to go into a little circle at the bottom of your bowl. So you can ask him afterwards how that actually works. Um, I don't know if Kip Parker is in the audience. He might be. Um, but he invented, um, his group actually, invented um, cotton candy machine to whip out fibers um, that can be used um, to grow cells to heal organs. Um, that's almost food. Um, and I'll have one other example of how uh, the School of Engineering um, really um, is a proponent of food, as well as this course, of course, and that is Joanne Chang, who, who um, was a concentrator in applied math in uh, 91. Um, she went into finance, but she left finance for baking. Um, she now owns three local bakeries. And um, so we now have a chef of our own as uh, alumnus, alumna. Um, will, you know, certainly the two worlds of applied science as, um, as important as cooking is and um, uh, master chefs um, is an uh, inc incredible ingredient and um, the School of Engineering will continue to bring these together and we hope to continue with this for many years to come. Now, I have the pleasure of introducing another professor, um, kind of the lead professors in the course, Dave Waits. So, so 
So I don't want to spend very much time uh, talking because I want to get to the main event, but I wanted to say a couple of words about how uh, this course really came about. And um, it started, as many things do in Harvard, as seen on the next slide, uh, with a wonderful postdoc, Oje Campos, who came to me one day and said, let's invite Ferran to visit. And I said, he will never come. And, and, and in his own way, uh, Oje said, yes, let's do it. And so we wrote a letter. I wrote a letter. He transla translated it into Catalan. And the next thing we knew, the next slide, Ferran agreed to come. <laughs> And, this was a tremendous surprise, and in the next slide, we had a public lecture which was as full as this was, but we didn't have this room. And we had it, yeah, a mob scene, and we never seen anything like it. And this was sort of a, uh, something that gave us some hint of what was going to come. And so Ferran and I talked after his public lecture. We realized what it would be like. And in the next slide, we agreed that we would <laughs> teach a course. Um, and this was, of course, a dream come true, I think, for both of us. For Ferran, it was a way of bringing science to cooking. And for me, it was a way of doing something I've always wanted to do, and that's actually get students truly interested in physics, which is something that I try to do, I've tried for years with no success. I've never seen something like this. Um, and so in the next slide, the people who really put it together and the person who really uh, was the, the driving force of this was Michael Brenner, who said, let's make this into a general education course, which is what it's become. And he assembled a team of people, Jose, and a group of people who will introduce, who've done an enormous amount of work. And they're really the ones who deserve all the credit for uh, bringing the course to the, uh, to the university. And we decided we also want to have these public lectures to share with the rest of the community what we're doing with our students. So with that, let me uh, ask Michael to uh, tell you more about the course. OK, so my job is to tell you about the course, which hopefully will come up on the screen. So um, as Dave said, so this course has um, has required the work of a large number of people, and I just want to thank um, a number of them here. Of course, principal to thank is Farron and Jose and Harold, who in many ways, um, without with whom, without which not, this never would have occurred. Um, the, um, the, um, so um, there were a group of instructors. There are four instructors um, besides. And actually, what I would really like to happen is that for all of these people to please stand up. So I would like Amy Roa, OJ Compass. There is a course development team of graduate students who spent the summer um, working on this. You guys have to um, get up. Jen, and you guys have to stand up. Um, there was Mater. Um, there are um, two people from Alicia Foundation, Mater and Para, Para Castells. And finally, there was Christina, who now has to stand up, who is the grand organizer of the entire thing, um, without which we really wouldn't be here today. And um, um, all of these people work tirelessly to bring um, this course about. What we're talking about here, of course, is a public lecture series that mirrors the course. And what I would like to do, just to delay, um, so this is the warm-up act for, I, now I understand how, I'm trying to think of a, now I understand how warm-up acts feel. Um, so I'm going to get this done very quickly. But what I'd like to do is give you a, a little bit of a sense of what the content of the course is going to be and what the students will see and how this relates to the public lecture series that hopefully all of you will come and partake in as well. So next slide. So, the, so as um, Evelyn and Dave have mentioned, this is a science class. This is not a cooking class. Um, the, um, the, um, I mean, in fact, um, neither Dave nor I can cook. Um, we, um, we've demonstrated this already to the students. Um, um, fortunately, all the teaching fellows and Amy and OJ can cook, and we have these guys. Um, but our goal is to basically make a course, was to make a course in which the material was so inviting that we could convince people to teach science that they may otherwise not want to learn, and indeed learn how to ask questions that are scientific questions of the sort that you're going to hear in a little bit. Next slide. So um, it's not a cooking class. I already said that. Next slide. Um, so, okay, so the way the class works is that every week there are two lectures. There's a, a Thursday lecture, typically, in which there's a science lecture to introduce the theme of the chef um, who is coming on the following Tuesday. Um, the following Tuesday, the chef, then we give a brief scientific introduction. The chef um, gives a talk, and then we, um, we have a discussion. 
This week was special for obvious reasons, um, but from now on, this is the way the course will go forth. The class has a laboratory component, which I want to show you, and also homework and their exams and all of those sorts of things that should be in a science class. Next slide. Um, so, okay, so the second week of the course, which is going to also be the second week of the public lecture series, the topic is phases of matter. I just want to go through one topic to give you an idea of how this goes. And what we're going to discuss, that is the main idea of the week, is the idea um, that, that the molecular structure of materials underlie their phase behavior. And this, of course, is critical for cooking. So Juan Roca is our chef of the week, and he will talk about states of matter. Um, next slide. And sous vide. Um, every week we have a, a very clearly laid out set of principles that we would like um, the students to learn. Um, there are learning objectives which are about science. So for example, we would like the students to understand how chefs use phase diagrams to manipulate food and how to read phase diagrams. We'd like them to understand the connection between phase boundaries and microscopic structure of materials. And what will happen in the public lecture series every week is that for a very short time, even shorter than the time that I'm talking now, either Dave or I will get up and tell you what the learning objectives are of the week, and then we will listen to the chef. We won't explain anything. You, we won't go into it. We also have an equation of the week. I'm a mathematician, so I like equations. And finally, and this is very important, and this is the last thing I really want to show you, we have a recipe of the week. Um, and the recipe of the first week is pressure cook custard. Next slide. So now how is that going to work? So it turns out we are very fortunate. And this is one of the situations in life where, um, besides the thing that Dave's described coming together, this really came together. And it was very unique. So there was a laboratory in the ground floor of the Northwest Building, which is the new science building that Harvard built a couple of years ago, which had never been used by a chemistry lab to contaminate it. We were therefore allowed to basically transform it into a laboratory which is food safe. And the laboratory is equipped with microscopes and equipment um, with which one can do science experiments. And every week, the students will do a lab in which they will carry out experiments while cooking. This is a group of the teaching fellows having fun testing the lab. Notice the microscope. <laughs> next, next slide. And the lab is really an amazing thing. So these are pictures of the drawers in the lab. Thermocouples, cutting boards, funnels. See, you guys would be proud. Um, there are plates that are stacked up in the science lab. Next slide. Microscope. Notice there's a skeleton in the back corner. Um, <laughs> Emily's reading on food and cooking. This is very important, too. It's, it plays a prominent role in our laboratory. And there's a constant temperature heat bath that, that Alicia provided us when they went to the lab and said, how could you not have a constant temperature heat, heat bath? And the next week, several of them came in the mail. Um, so, um, so this is part of the first lab. The students will cook eggs at a fixed temperature. Next slide. And um, they will cook custard. And this is the, um, the custard. And because of the fact that the lab is food safe, if the proper precautions are obeyed, then the students can eat the lab. Next slide. So and this will go on. And I'm now going to go through very quickly. The next week is food components. Jose will come back and be our star chef of the week. Next slide. Next slide. Um, the, ne the following week is texture and mouthfeel viscosity. We have Carlos Tejador. Um, next slide. Heating, cooling, and temperature. This, this actually produced a standing ovation, more or less, from the class um, when we put it up um, on Thursday. Um, we, Henri Rivera, who's a master chocolatier, is the guest of the week. The recipe of the week is molten chocolate cake. Next slide. And this is my favorite picture of all, which I think really demonstrates the essence of the course. You see, the students cook chocolate cake, and there are thermocouples that are basically in that they measure the temperature rise as a function of time, and that's how it goes. So now let's go through the next couple very quickly, because I want to stop being the warm-up act. We go through electrostatics. They will make cheese. Keep going. Next slide. Foams and emulsions. Next slide. Gelation. Jose will come back again, which is um, we're going to teach them physics. We're going to tell them about Dejen, who's one of Dave's and my heroes that we never get to talk about, or when we do, no one listens. But this time, they're going to listen. Next slide. Um, and we're going to tell them about this. Next slide. Um, and then we're going to talk about more advanced concepts. Next slide. Um, and then um, Wiley Dufresne is going to come, and we're going to do meat glue mania. Next slide. And for that, actually, the teaching staff, and this is one of the amazing things about the class, last Tuesday before the course started, the teaching staff took a field trip to WD50 in New York City in which Wiley taught them how to make shrimp noodles. Next slide. That's lab number seven. Um, you have to use an enzyme transglutaminase, which um, allows you to cross link shrimp. Next slide. Um, um, Dan Barber, soil and microbes. This, uh, this week will actually, the, the faculty member who takes care of this will be Roberto Coulter from Harvard Medical School, who's a fabulous scientist and an extremely charismatic speaker. And he, he and Dan are working hard to make this into a terrific week. Next slide. Um, foams and emulsions, Bill Yossis. Next slide. And then finally, this is the last slide. This is the public lecture series that accompanies this um, course. And what you will see is that essentially in every week, 
We will, um, the guest lecturer will give a, uh, uh, will give a lecture on Monday night. It will not be here, it will be in Science Center D, and we really do invite you all to come and partake. And, um, you know, that one of the goals of this, as Dave said, really is um, uh, to reach out to the community and to sort of show the things that we're trying to do and to get your feedback. And so that's that. So with that, I'm now at the end of the warm-up act. That's it. So now is for the main event. And so I'm going to turn it over to Harold McGee, who's going to get us started, right? You're going to do it. You betcha. OK. You betcha. Thank you very much. Um, I wish I was a student again. Uh, and, and I have to start by saying, in fact, uh, how mind-boggling it is for me to be standing here today uh, talking to you about this subject in the context of a course being given on the science of cooking. Because um, I wrote a book 30-odd uh, years ago on food and cooking. Uh, and I wrote it mostly in the Schlesinger Library, right across the street. Yes. Uh, I couldn't have written the book without that library. It was, it was very important. Uh, this was back in the day before computers, so I did it on an electric typewriter. I'd really depended on libraries the way people depend less on libraries today, but that, that kind of um, opportunity to start at one corner of the room, work my way around the room, and take samples through history of how people have cooked different ingredients different ways was just, just invaluable. But at the time, nobody was really interested in the science of cooking. In fact, that's why I could write a book about it. Uh, and so the question is, what happened in the last uh, 20 or 30 years? Why are we here tonight having this wonderful uh, event? And so uh, what I'm going to try to do is set a little historical context for the talks that uh, Ferran and Jose are going to give to try to explain how, how it is that we got here. Uh, so the first slide uh, is to point out that um, science, the application of science in the kitchen per se is not a new idea. It goes way back, and the idea of using it to uh, innovate in the kitchen goes way back. So this is uh, a, uh, an illustration from a French book from the 18th century, and uh, the translation is right up there. It, it talks about nouvelle cuisine in 1759. Uh, and in order to develop nouvelle cuisine, you need to be a chemist. Back then, what that meant was you need to know your materials. You need to understand what they're composed of. You need to come up with new permutations and combinations, new compounds in order to meet the changing tastes of, of the times. The next slide shows uh, even before that point, uh, seven or eight decades before that, uh, the, the kitchen and the eating experience were transformed by a scientific discovery. That is to say, the, uh, the discovery of the gas laws. The fact that the temperature of a liquid that, uh, that, that's boiling depends on the pressure surrounding it. So you could use that information to invent what Papin invented. He called it a digester. We call it a pressure cooker. Uh, and in the next slide, you'll see a, uh, an excerpt from John Evelyn's report. He was a, remember, a member of the Royal Society. The members of the Royal Society were generally bachelors. And it seems as though they were look, looking always for excuses to go out and eat at someone else's expense. And uh, Papin would demonstrate his digesters. He would put foods in them, different foods in them, and then the fellows of the Royal Society would get together and have a party. And if you just read through this, you'll see that for them, this was a completely new experience. Uh, bones that were made to have the consistency of cheese. Fish that are bony that don't seem to have bones in them once they're done. The very best jelly he's ever tasted. Uh, so this is science applied to cooking hundreds of years ago, and it made a tremendous difference. Next slide. Uh, this man, Count Rumford, Rumford Baking Powder, he's the guy who endowed the professorship. He's not as well known in this country as he should be because he picked the wrong side in the Revolutionary War. <laughs> so he endowed professorships, but he never came back after the war. He did most of his work in Europe. He invented, essentially, our modern oven, uh, a uh, metal box that we heat in order to get a, a temperature. He's also the guy who did the first experiments on what's since become 
uh, kind of modern 20th, 20th, 21st century orthodoxy for cooking meat. Very low temperatures give you the best results. He figured that out hundreds of years ago by cooking uh, legs of mutton in his potato dryer and discovering by accident that cooking in a potato dryer, which only operates at, well, way less than boiling, gives you much more succulent meat. He's also, as far as I can tell, the first guy who did any kind of um, controlled food science experiment. He was convinced that this technique was much better than roasting over a fire, but he had to demonstrate it. And so he demonstrated it by throwing a party, putting a leg of mutton roasted over the fire at one end of the room, a leg of mutton roasted in his potato dryer at the other end of the room, and at the end of the party, he weighed what was left of the two roasts. <laughs> and there was a lot more left of the, of the fire-roasted mutton. Uh, next slide. Uh, and this is to demonstrate that you can be a chemist and you can screw up. So this guy, Eustace Liebig, very important chemist in, in the history of the de development of chemistry, uh, took an interest, unfortunately, in cooking. And uh, he doesn't seem to have done a lot of experiments, unlike Rumford. And uh, he came out with a theory in the middle of the 19th century that searing meat would seal in its juices by cauterizing the outside, preventing the juices from coming out. And uh, there was clearly a hunger at that time for some kind of rational approach to cooking. So in the next slide, you'll see that a, a book that uh, came out in multiple editions, and an edition came out after Rumford published his researches, uh, now says that in the subtitle that the principles of Baron Liebig have been applied to cooking meat in this book, and therefore it's up to date, and it's scientific, and there's a quotation from uh, another holder, actually, of the Rumford chair. Uh, uh, I forget his first name, but Dr. Gregory. It's the one of a scientific basis that has given rise to, uh, rise to absurd methods of preparing food. The problem is, uh, next slide, if you do the experiment, and anyone who's ever cooked a steak has done the experiment, you always see with your own eyes that there's no such thing as sealing the juices in, in a piece of meat. But that's still something that you'll hear said casually on TV shows, uh, said in magazine pieces. I've been trying for decades to get it killed, but I haven't been able to kill it. <laughs> next slide. Uh, so there, there was a lot of interest in uh, science applied to the kitchen in the 19th century. What happened in the 20th century? Because by the time I came on the scene, not much had been written about it, and that's why I wrote a book. Uh, and I think it has in part to do with a couple of developments. One of them is the, oddly, the development of home economics, that is to say the institutionalization of the study, uh, scientific study of cooking. Because it took a very particular direction. Uh, Ellen Richards was uh, the first woman graduate of, of MIT. She uh, helped found Woods Hole. She was a remarkable scientist and pioneer in all kinds of ways. Uh, and she also helped start the uh, home economics profession in the United States. But you'll see in the next slide that in order to make it a respectable profession for a woman, you had to um, kind of situate it correctly. And clearly, um, uh, anything that appealed to pleasure rather than to things like hygiene, safety, economy, and things like that uh, wasn't, uh, didn't count for as much. And so flavor in the writings of these people who founded the discipline uh, was relegated essentially to the status of a contaminant. You know, if you like something, it's because there are bacteria that you're used to, and it has nothing to do with the goodness of the food. So the recipes that you find coming out of this movement are things like a mayonnaise, where you replace the olive oil with mineral oil, because mineral oil is, it's not going to spoil on you. Uh, next slide. There was also the, the food security issue in the United States. Uh, back then, it wasn't uh, worries about terrorism. It was worries and, and global warming and things like that. It was simply worries about adulteration. A lot of foods in the United States were adulterated. And so the Pure Food and Drug Act was passed in 1906. Uh, that man mandated uh, analysis of foods to prove that they were pure. And that meant you had to have analytical chemists who would do that kind of work. And that gave rise to the food science uh, profession. Uh, again, nothing to do with pleasure, nothing to do with the process of making foods. 
It's more to do with, with safety and things like that. Uh, this, by the way, these are pictures of the poison squad, as they were known. These were the people who would eat things to see whether they made you sick or not. <laughs> Next slide. Uh, so, a, a hi hiatus in interest and, and, and discussion of the science of cooking until this man in uh, England gave a lecture that was broadcast on the BBC about the science of cooking. He was a physicist, he, had, uh, he was a fellow of the Royal Society, he had status, people listened to him, and he was a wonderful advocate for uh, bringing science to bear in the kitchen. And so he said this wonderful thing that we, uh, we know what the temperature is inside the, the atmosphere of Venus, but we don't know what's happening inside our souffles. And so he took care of the souffle issue. This is a, uh, an experiment that he ran on TV. Uh, for some reason, zero time is here, and time runs that. of writing it, that lots of questions that I was interested in hadn't been answered by the food scientists. Not surprising because they were interested in, in safety and manufacturing and that kinds of thing. Uh, so I began to do experiments on my own, and, and that's essentially why I've kept writing about food, because it's, uh, it's just such a wonderful subject, and there are things you can learn about it every single day. So uh, the next slide is an example of the kinds of experiments that that I've done, in fact, this was really the first one. Julia Child said, uh, and I used to walk by her house every day on the way from Somerville to the library, um, that when you whip egg whites to make a, a meringue or a souffle, you should use a copper bowl because that uh, gives you a better foam. And I couldn't think of any reason that would be true. I didn't find any reason in the literature, so I didn't pay much attention to it until I saw in a French book that was several hundred years old, exactly the same claim. And so I gave it a try, did the experiment side by side, and it makes a tremendous difference. The uh, uh, foam made in a copper bowl has a different color, consistency, length of time it takes to get to that stage, stability, all kinds of things. I tried to figure out, um, again, with a read through the literature, what was going on, got no help, found a sympathetic scientist with some equipment, and we did some experiments together, came up with a theory. I sent it to Nature, and uh, they put it through their usual review process, and it was published in 1984. Uh, that's the, the page right there. Uh, the reviewers said the science was fine, but the subject was a little fluffy. <laughs> and I think right there is a sign of uh, the change in the times, because fluffy is in, soft matter is in. That's what people want to study now. Next slide. Um, the term molecular gastronomy is often used in connection with modern cooking, and it, it's because there was a meeting held uh, several times on the island of Sicily at a science conference center uh, organized by Nicholas Curti, by Elizabeth Thomas, who was a wonderful uh, uh, cooking teacher in Berkeley, California, and myself, and a man named Hervé Thys in France, who were all co-organizers. Co uh, and it was a, a very interesting set of meetings, uh, mostly scientists, a few chefs. Um, Pierre Gilles de Gênes came once and gave a talk, and uh, yeah, yeah, that's right, that's right. Yeah, she, she came too, and we had animated conversations between the two of them especially. Uh, so uh, anyway, it was a wonderful meeting. Um, it had very little influence on the development of cooking. Uh, it, it lent a term that has a kind of catchiness to it that I think is unfortunate because it really doesn't describe uh, the interest of the subject. Um, uh, but what happened in Ferran's restaurant and in other modern restaurants had basically nothing to do 
with what happened at the, at the RHA meetings, despite the fact that you'll read uh, uh, the, the contrary in, in a lot of accounts. Next slide. So that's a quick overview of, uh, of science in the kitchen. Now I want to just give you a, a very quick overview, and this is, this is, I apologize that it's such a caricature of a couple of hundred, 300 years of culinary history, which is very rich. Uh, but just to give you a sense of, uh, of what the last 20 or 30 years uh, have meant and, and why we're here tonight, uh, a very quick look at the, the professional kitchen pre Ferran. Uh, so next slide. Uh, 1750, a Frenchman writing about what it is that a cook should be doing in the kitchen as a chemist. And the job essentially is to harmonize, to get the essences out of foods and then to harmonize them to, so that no particular element dominates the others. Everything is there in a kind of balance. And I think that that basically uh, holds true even today. That, that idea of balance and harmony and so on is, is sort of at the, the root of what uh, classic French cooking is all about. Next slide. Uh, Carême and Escoffier are two kind of landmark figures in the development of French cooking. And basically what they did was uh, start with that, uh, that basic idea and then elaborate on it. And by the end of many, many elaborations, what you ended up with were guidebooks, guide culinaire, very, very thick, uh, full of what amount to themes and variations. Relatively few themes, lots and lots of variations. Uh, so, uh, and, and many of the themes have to do with meat extracts. That's really at the base even of, uh, of most vegetable preparations were, were finished with a sauce that, that came from meat. So it's a very highly developed and wonderful cuisine, but it occupies a fairly narrow part of the spectrum. Next slide. Uh, the French themselves began to feel a little restless about this in the, in the late 60s, early 70s. And so uh, a new nouvelle cuisine developed. And these are the Ten Commandments that were uh, kind of formulated not by the chefs themselves, who tended to be kind of um, mavericks, uh, not, not, a, not about to make commandments for other people. These were are, these are put together by journalists who were trying to understand the movement in general. And uh, you'll see various things that have to do, in fact, with eliminating brown and white sauces because they were so overused. But two important things, seek out what new techniques can bring you, and you shall be inventive. Uh, at that time, new techniques, new technologies included things like uh, uh, electrical blenders, which give you really, really fine purees, finer than, than what you could make before easily, and, and things like that, things that, that would not be that surprising to us today. Next slide. Uh, so we finally come to uh, Ferran, and here he is. This is a meeting in uh, Cannes, and he's written about this uh, 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 in, in detail and, and in really fascinating ways. The fact that he, he went to this meeting of French chefs and heard uh, the man who's standing at the far left in this photograph, Jacques Maximin, say, to be creative means not to copy. And um, that, for whatever reasons, resonated with Ferran in a way that uh, nothing else had. And that kind of changed his life, and that changed the course of culinary history. And that's why we're here tonight. Uh, next slide. Just to, to give you an idea of um, what creativity meant in Ferran's hands as opposed to, say, the hands of the, of the chefs of the Nouvelle Cuisine. Michel Bras is a, a kind of second generation Nouvelle Cuisine chef, works in the Auvergne, uh, greatly respected, um, um, all kinds of things you could say about him. And by the way, the, the molten chocolate cake that is going to be made in the course is his idea. So that's why it's there. Um, next slide, he uh, is in a part of France, uh, the southeast, which is very uh, rich in, um, in native plants that are edible and that had not been used in classic French cooking. And so he thought that one of the things that he could do would be to use the local things 
uh, in season to make dishes that were very special to his place. And so he invented something that he called the gargouillou in the next slide, which is uh, a miscellany of uh, herbs, vegetables, sprouts, all kinds of things that he would gather or his people would gather in the course of the morning and then prepare over the course of the day. And each one was prepared separately because a different leaf is going to require a different kind of preparation. You want to do each one perfectly. Uh, so this, this dish, uh, which was classical in a way, but revolutionary in a way, uh, quickly became a, uh, an icon. And uh, people used it as a kind of reference point for the new way of looking at cooking. So next slide. Uh, this is what Ferran did with the same idea. He, he tasted uh, and experienced the gargouillou, and uh, as he's written, he thought about it for a few years. You know, what, what can I do with that basic idea, but really be creative with it? And what he did with it is this, which is, again, a mixture of, uh, in this case, fruits as well as vegetables and, and an herb. Uh, but if you look at it, it's uh, none of the components of the dish look like what they came from. So Michel Bras takes the bounty of nature, celebrates the, the bounty of nature, presents it to you as the bounty of nature in a beautiful way. Ferran starts with the bounty of nature and then moves on to the bounty of the imagination. What can we as human beings do with these wonderful natural materials to make them even more interesting or if not more interesting, because it's not really comparison in that sense, what can we do with these things that has not been done before and that can give us something more from the experience of cooking and eating than we've gotten uh, in the past? So it's a, a commitment to a different level of creativity, take, taking it as far as possible, opening the doors as wide as possible making food and cooking much more interesting and making the science of food and cooking much more interesting in the same, uh, at the same moment. <laughs> Next slide. Um, and I'll just kind of pass through that because he'll do a much, much better job than uh, I can paraphrasing or, or printed words can about what it means to be creative. Uh, except to point out that uh, if you take this expansive a view of cooking and the possibilities of cooking and the experience of eating, uh, and coupled with that, the, the openness of, uh, uh, that, that science and technology give us to deeper understandings and different things that we can do as we, as we understand more and more, it just opens everything. Next slide, please. Uh, so, uh, Ferran has a, uh, what's essentially a research and development laboratory that works on creativity in particular without other uh, uh, distractions and it's resulted in just an, an amazing body of work, a body of, of accomplishment. Next. Next slide, please. Uh, now, a few examples of the kinds of things that this kind of openness of mind has made possible for other chefs. Um, and a number of these people are, in fact, people who will be coming to teach in the course and to give public lectures, and so you'll be seeing them if you come back. Uh, Jose Andres is right here, and I put this up uh, because this is one of the most beautiful dishes I've ever seen. It's, uh, it's about that big, and it's olive oil encapsulated in uh, a material that's like sugar, but not like sugar. So it's actually more um, uh, versatile. You can do things with it that you can't do with sugar. But one of the things you can do with it is blow it the way you can blow sugar. And so it's a drop of olive oil inside this uh, very fragile vessel with a piece of sea salt on top, a little bit of vinegar powder underneath. So it's, it's sort of the essence of a vinaigrette without the salad. You just pop it in your mouth, it's there, and it's gone, and, and it's gorgeous. Next slide. Uh, Wiley Dufresne is coming to use meat glue, transglutaminase, uh, to make things like noodles that are pure 
shrimp, no starch, no filler, no binder. It takes care of itself. Uh, and the best chicken nuggets you've ever had. <laughs> Next slide. Uh, Juan Roca is coming, and he specializes, among other things, in distillation, which is a way of extracting aromas and separating them from the materials that they occur in, and then you can recombine them in, in all kinds of ways. This is a dish that made a huge impression on me. It's a, you can't really quite see, but it's an oyster embedded in a jelly. And uh, you bite into it, and you taste the oyster right away, and then slowly, over the course of 15 or 20 seconds, you feel as though you're walking through the forest. Uh, it's, uh, and it's because he's taken a handful of forest soil, distilled it, into uh, just its aroma, and then infuse that into the jelly. Next slide. Uh, Grant Ackett, who will be here uh, as well, uh, has been doing lots and lots of very interesting things. This one really caught my eye about two months ago when I was there. He now um, makes desserts on the table in front of you, uh, comes over with, with a pile of materials, and just creates it right, right uh, as you sit there watching, takes your input, and we will add a bit of this or that if you ask for it. Um, but what caught my eye uh, was not so much that as the fact that when he took a little dipper of liquid, uh, a sauce, and put it down in the lower left frame, you'll see that it spread and made round corners and square corners. How do you do that? That's, that's one for the physicists. <coughs> Next slide. So, uh, uh, the last 20 years have been really amazing, and this, this catalog raisonné that the Tate Modern Museum put out of Ferran's dishes is one testimony to that. It's also quite a testimony that the, the uh, author, the creator's portrait on the book was done by the creator of The Simpsons, which I think attests to a certain level of, um, how should we say, uh, cultural significance. Uh, it's, uh, it's really a remarkable 20 years. And so that's kind of why we're here, and now time to listen to the real, uh, the real reason we're all here, which is to hear Farhan and Jose talk about their work. So, thanks. Uh, good evening. Uh, buenas noches. <laughs> uh, someone has to translate. Hace dos años cuando estuve aquí prometí que estudiaría inglés. Two years ago when he came here he he kind of promised he will study English. Pero habéis visto que no. But no. as you see it didn't happen. <laughs> eh, antes que nada habéis visto la, la película Ratatouille, ¿no? Uh, first of, of all. Uh, have you seen Ratatouille? Yes, no? The movie. Hay Remy, que es la rata. Remy, Remy, the, 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 the rat. Y Linguini, que es el cocinero. Eh? And Linguini, which is, is the cook. Entonces, José Andrés y yo es lo mismo. So, Ferran Adriana is kind of the same. La cuestión es quién es la rata y quién es el lenguini. Uh, the issue is who is the rat and uh, who is uh, the mouse and the, who is one and who is the other. Al final, oh. al final de la sesión veremos a ver. At the end of this uh, speech of this class we'll see who is who. Eh, yo cuando he llegado aquí estaba media hora viendo qué hacía esto del backing power, ¿no? When when we arrive here, when he arrive here, he, we sat down. And Ferran was looking at the baking powder and was looking at me, digo, asking himself, what is this doing here? Digo, Esto no está en la clase, he no was asking himself, this is no, not part no, of the class. I mean, no. who put baking powder in the table? Me he hecho, me hecho uh, so he created kind of 100 stories in his brain aquí. of why this was here. And I can tell you, he was looking at me badly, like, no. blaming me. <laughs> this is off the translation. No. <laughs> Al final he visto cuál era la buena. Uh, at the end, he saw uh, the story that was the good one, thanks to the explanation of the dinner. Uh, pero al final, eh, pero sirve un poco de ejemplo para para explicar un poco lo, cómo yo veo la vida, ¿no? 
but this maybe is a good example uh, for him to explain you how he sees life. La curiosidad y la ganas de aprender. Which uh, he sees life through curiosity and the willing to learn. Muy importante, muy importante tener siempre ganas de aprender. It's unbelievably important to always have the need to learn, the willingness to learn. Quiero dar las gracias a toda la gente que ha organizado el curso. Um, he really wants to thank everyone that has created this uh, course, this class. Aquí en Harvard. Here at Harvard. En Cataluña, en España. Also en, back in Spain, in Catalonia. Pere Castell y todo el equipo de Alicia han trabajado muy duro. Pere Castell and his foundation, Alicia, everyone has worked uh, really hard to make this happen. Para que sea, para conseguir algo histórico, ¿no? To achieve something like he believes is really historical. Eh, dentro de 10, 15 años, in 10, 15 years from now, todos los que estamos hoy aquí diremos, ¿te acuerdas el día? He believed that everyone that is here today in this room presentó... will say, wow, do you remember that day that we were talking about food and science at Harvard? No, no. Porque, sin duda alguna, esto es un curso icónico. Because he believes this really is going to be a course that is iconic. Va a ser muy importante. El día a día, lo que se haga. It's going to be very important in the day to day, everything we're going to be doing here. Pero va a ser next... mucho más importante la consecuencia de lo que va a significar. What is going to be happening during the next few weeks here at Harvard on food and science course is going to be important, but this is going to be even more important what is going to be happening after that course, because this is going to have good consequences. Entonces Harvard tiene un reto, tiene so, un challenge. Esto en inglés lo sé. So uh, Harvard has a, uh, a reto. Because he said challenge, your reto is Spanish. Eh. Harvard really has a challenge, a good one, que es ahead. Con continuar y reforzar todo esto. Which is moving forward what has begun today and reinforce what's happening right la, now. La cocina no, no había entrado en la universidad. Cooking never ever got into university. En España, en los últimos cinco años, in Spain, in the last five years, por el movimiento que, que, que ha habido, because the movement that Ferran obviously has helped create, poco a poco hemos ido entrando, slowly it was kind of a certain relationship between cooking and universities. Pero hacía falta que en la, entrar en la mejor universidad del mundo. But he believes it was unbelievably important that cooking got into the best university in the world. Mañana va a hablar todo el mundo, toda la prensa mundial. Tomorrow, everyone, all the world press, They're going to be talking about this moment. Y esto va, va a tener un efecto multiplicador. And, and this is going to have a multiplying, a multiplying effect. Uh, antes de seguir, me gustaría que vierais un, un DVD. Um, before we move, for, we move forward, he, he would like you to see a, a DVD. De cuatro minutos. ¿Espera? Of four minutes that tells you the story of El Bulli for the, for the last 50-something years. Y vais a ver lo importante que es una banda una banda sonora para una película. And you're going to hear a great soundtrack for a great movie. Vale. <laughs> Ground control to Major Tom. Ground control to Major Tom. Take your protein pills and put your helmet on. Ground control to Major Tom. Seven. Six. Commencing countdown engines on. Three. Two. Check ignition and may God's love be with you. Stars look very different 
Este clip unas 300 veces. Uh, he has seen this clip over 300 times, maybe more. Pero no me canso nunca de verlo. But he never gets tired of, of, of watching it. Pero no por porque yo haya participado en esto, ¿no? Uh, no because he's obvious part of the story. Sino por por porque para mí es un homenaje a, a toda la gente que ha hecho posible. El bully durante toda esta historia. Because this video is an homage to every single person that they made el bully possible over the years. Esto es lo que primero explico a todo el mundo que pasa a trabajar para el bully. You know, the, this is something he explains to everyone that comes to work uh, through el bully every year. Si tú puedes estar en el bully, un sitio maravilloso gracias a toda la gente que ha hecho. If este you can be at the bully today and you can be working today at the bully, it's only thanks. Everyone that has come before you. <coughs> so it's an homage to everyone really that has contributed to El Bulli in bigger or smaller ways. Maybe some of you heard that uh, El Bulli is closing, right? It's been kind of in the news more or less. No, El Bulli no se cierra, El Bulli se transforma. Okay, El Bulli is not closing its doors. El bully is only going through a transformation. Lo puedes explicar en qué se va a convertir si quieres, ¿eh? <laughs> because, pero hay cosas que no, no. I translate for you. <laughs> he always loves to pass me the thing and he says, explain the story. I'm like, no, <laughs> I'm translated. <laughs> because he's always telling me, you can tell this, but you cannot tell this. And then I translate and I tell the things I'm not supposed <laughs> to be saying. In the stand, eh? In the stand, cuidado. In the stand. <laughs> Que él entiende. Ok, no. eh, el, so 30, Bulli, el 30 de julio del 2011. The 30th of July of 2011. Se cerrará el Bully Restaurante. 
El Bulli, as a restaurant, will close its doors. Y el 31 de julio, and the 31st of July, empezaremos a trabajar en un, en un proyecto. The new project begins. En un centro de creatividad. Uh, his work, they will start working in a center for creativity. Alrededor de la cocina. Always around cooking. Donde cada noche se colgará en internet todo lo que se crea. Where every night they will publish on the web everything they created during the day. Eh, en la cocina, los cocineros estamos trabajando todo el día. Uh, in the kitchen, uh, cooks, we, we work all day, long hours. N y no se puede crear. And it's almost impossible to be working on the kitchen, feeding people, and create at the same time. No hay presupuesto para creatividad. Uh, there is not a budget for creativity that pays for creativity. No, toda la gente que hemos creado en estos últimos años ha sido, pues, ¿cómo, cómo hemos podido? Um, everything uh, he and Chef has created over the years is just creating, working hard, and more or less, you know, trying to find time uh, around the busy uh, kitchen uh, schedule to create. Yo he sido un privilegiado porque cerraba seis meses el restaurante y solo había por la noche. He, he feels he's always been very lucky because he only opened El Bulli during six months and only opened at night. That gave him always extra time to create. Y por esto este centro va a ser una fundación privada. So that's why, uh, why he's very happy that this new center for creativity is going to be a private foundation. Y que, queremos que se convierta un poco en una red social de creatividad. And, and what he really dreams of this uh, new center to become is a social net for culinary creativity. Quiero que la gente tenga un lugar, la gente no tiene tiempo, esté en Perú, esté en Noruega, esté en Harvard, esté en Barcelona, esté en cualquier lugar, pueda tener un sitio de referencia que le ayude en el, tra en el trabajo diario. He, he wants this new center really Uh, uh, to be a, a, a source for anyone around the world that maybe they are working and they don't have the time for creativity. They want, he wants El Bulli, the new creativity center, to be this, this uh, place for resources for anyone looking for ideas. Es un muy loco. It's, a, it's really a crazy project. No, no, estoy viendo la cara que ponéis y no, 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 uh, todo el mundo dice, pero ¿qué, qué hice? Uh, you know, he's looking at your faces and he's thinking that you are thinking that He's, you are thinking that he's saying, what, what are they thinking? I mean, he, he, he thinks that you, you know, you know what I mean. En el, <laughs> so, what is he doing? In the year 1998, the, the first time that uh, he, he created El Taller, his first center for creativity, también la gente pone la misma cara. When he will tell the story about I'm creating a center for creativity and he will mm. tell the story, people will mm. look at him like, what eh, is he doing? He's he crazy. Estamos muy ilusionados en el nuevo proyecto. So he's really happy with this new venture in his life, with this new project. Porque creo que ayudará a que la cocina continúe evolucionando. Because he believes this new center for creativity is going to help cooking to keep the evolution, uh, evolution forward. Y necesitamos a la universidad. And he believes we need the university to make that happen. Necesitamos el conocimiento. Uh, we need knowledge. Uh, we need the know-how. Como habéis visto en este clip que hay muchas veces, muchas de las, de las relaciones que yo tengo con el mundo del arte, con el mundo del diseño. In this clip, probably you saw, you know, the relationship he has with the, with the design world, with the art world. Es por todo el diálogo que yo he tenido con otras Disciplinas. Because he's been uh, keeping a dialogue with any other disciplines in the, in the creative world. Y esto es un poco lo que hemos iniciado con el departamento ¿no? de física, con, con, con el mundo de la ciencia en Harvard. ¿no? And, and he believes this is what's happening right now by partnering at the physics department at Harvard, bringing science and cooking together. ¿No? Y todo lo, si las enfermedades del mundo miran la cocina, ¿no? ¿No? Si, si las universidades del mundo... Si, if, if all the universities of the world finally start looking to cooking, ¿no? seguro que el, iremos adelante. Uh, he believes that uh, the cooking world is going to be moving forward even much faster uh, and better for all.
Todo depende de cómo lo miremos. Uh, that depends from on which angle we're going to be looking at that. ¿Cuántas veces hemos hecho esto? How many times we've done that, drinking water? No, miles de veces. Thousands of times, right? ¿Qué, qué hacemos? Beber agua. What, what are we doing? We're drinking water. Más o menos parecido al perrito que yo tengo en casa. ¿eh? Exactly the same thing as the dog that he has at home does every day. Sí, sí. Drinks water. Hacen It's an animal need. ¿Eh? You are thirsty, your body needs water, you drink it. ¿Eh? Si, nos, si lo hacemos como humanos. But if we do it like humans. Y reflexionamos un poquito. We start going through a thinking process. Vamos a ver. ¿no? We're going to start seeing things in this water that maybe we didn't see before. El agua es transparente. All of a sudden, we're going to be thinking that the water is transparent, that has no color, that you can see through. Que no, que no tiene olor. You know, you bring it to your nose and has no odor, has no smell. Un, pro, un producto que no tenga color ni tenga olor, nos costaría encontrarlo, ¿eh? And is, there are not many products in the food world that has no color and no odor. So it, it's a very unique thing. Veríamos que está a unos 10 grados. You know, uh, you, he tastes and, and he sees that the water is more or less at 10 Celsius degrees. Y el cuerpo humano acepta de menos 20 a más 60. Un, and then he thinks that, you know, the human body, when in the intake of food, more or less you enjoy foods that are around Minus 20 Celsius degrees, all the way to 60 Celsius degrees. Consomé o un helado? You enjoy a consomé, a hot consomé, a hot soup, or all the way down to an ice cream. Después veríamos que tiene una textura acuosa. Then when you put it in your mouth, you, you, you sense that it has a, a watery texture. Hay millones de texturas. Uh, don't laugh, because there are millions of textures. Millones. Millions that are edible. Después veríamos que no es ni dulce, ni salada, ni ácida, ni amarga. Then you will see that it's no sour, or sweet, or sour, or bitter. No tiene ningún gusto básico. You know, has no basic taste. Ni es astringente, ni picante. You know, it's no astringent, it's not spicy. No tiene ningún matiz al paladar. Uh, in the palate has no, you know, nothing eventful. You Después water. veríamos que... Eh, es agua. Then uh, you will do your reasoning and, and you will think, oh, actually, this is water. I mean, no, Porque we learn about it, right, since we are little. That's, that's por, water. Porque lo sabemos. And uh, we know it's water because they tell us it's water, right? Si viniera un, marcia, si viniera un marciano, no sabría qué es. You know, if uh, someone, an alien, will come from Mars, probably we'll look at that and we'll not know what this is. Because mm. you've never seen it before, maybe. Después podemos reflexionar sobre las millones de personas que, que, que mueren por, el, por no beber agua. You, uh, at another level, he will start thinking, ¿no? Uh, actually, today is people, millions of people that may die every year because they don't have actual access to good drinking, healthy water. ¿Qué pasaría si durante cinco días en nuestra casa no hubiera agua? Or what will happen if during five days we will not have tap water at our homes? Es decir, que podemos tomarnos la cocina de dos maneras. So, we can take cooking two ways. O así. Like this, drinking it, like with an animal feeling, you know. You, you drink it because you need it and that's it. O concentrándonos. But you can drink the water with pure concentration. Cuando ves esto, dices, esto es muy complicado, ¿eh? Uy, uy, uy. Then... When they, he explains you something like this, analyzing water, everyone will think, wow, this is really complicated if you have to do this. Bueno, muy complicado. Really complicated if every time you have to Pero, go through this process. Y, y, y hay una, una confirmación de esto. Y ahora decimos, me gustaría ver un libro, un buen libro, un gran libro, sobre estas reflexiones. You know, uh, and then he goes through the process of saying, wow, I would like to have a book a book that is really a very, very good book that goes through this same thought process that he's done in front of you. De lo complejo que puede llegar a ser la cocina. Of the complexity that cooking can be if you really do this thought process that he has shown you with a glass of water. Tendríamos que ir muy, muy lejos. And we will have to go very far, far away. Or, back in time. Um, we show them the book? Yes. With, for example, this book. Oh, man, I'm 
Espera, un break. Uh, de José Andrés, ¿eh? No, for, no, no. Mí, ¿eh? No, no. One day it'll be from Harvard. Es de ori original. No, no, original, original. Ey, el de José Andrés. Ah, no. No, no, 20 de, years ey, saving for this. Ey, ey. Uh, this, for example, uh, is a book from 1826. The man that wrote this book was ashamed of the ideas that were inside. So ashamed that in the first edition, right before he died in Paris, he never signed on the cover of the book. The book is The Physiology of Taste of Briat Savaran. Anyone that really loves food or the food thought knows about this man and knows about this book. Two important phrases inside. One, tell me what you eat and I'll tell you who you are. But probably the most important phrase ever written by him was the future of the nations will depend on how they feed themselves. Really, this man was a true visionary. <coughs> Yo no conozco un, un libro contemporáneo a este nivel. We bring this book, we, we talk to you about this book because today, 200 years later, he doesn't know about a contemporary book that talks about food at the level that Briat Savaran spoke in 1826. Por esto queremos decir que no se reflexiona, no se estudia sobre la cocina. With that, he wants to tell you that really today we are not really studying about cooking and the, cook and the meaning of cooking in our world, in our society. Estoy, estamos en la mejor universidad, universidad del mundo. We are in the best university in the world, Harvard. Sí. Aquí hay una facultad de historia. Uh, yeah, yeah. You, you have a, a history department, yeah? Yeah. Bueno. yeah. Oh, yeah. Bueno, Sorry. No, 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 no. I didn't ask that. He's asking. Ah, no, no, no. Obviously. The, si vamos, seguramente habrán muchos trabajos sobre la cocina románica. If we go to this uh, history department, probably it'll be a lot of work, a lot of thesis done on the cooking of the Romans. No creo que ning ningún profesor haya, haya vivido con los romanos. No. And probably no professor has lived with the Romans. That is a lie. No. It happened many centuries ago. Pero no hay, libros sobre, no hay ningún libro sobre la historia de la cocina contemporánea. But there are no books or no studies or no thesis about contemporary cooking, about cooking today in the 21st century. No hay ningún libro que yo conozca en el mundo que explique la cocina de los últimos 40, la alta cocina de los últimos 40 años en el mundo. He thinks there is no book that really explains what has happened at the avant-garde level of cooking during the last 30, 40 years. Okay. Con esto quiero decir que queda un camino maravilloso por recorrer. With that, you know, he wants to tell you that there we have a great, a great uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, walk to do to, to really start writing and thinking about all these issues of avant-garde cooking in the 21st century. Yo me dedico a la creatividad. Um, he, 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 he works uh, to creativity. That's what he does. Cuando la gente le pregunta, oye, pero esto que vas a hacer, ¿qué es exactamente? Uh, when people ask him, exactly, what are you going to be doing? Digo, enseñar a pensar. He always answers, I'm going to teach people to think. Para que creen bien. So, they will create in a good way. Lo más difícil que hay es el criterio. Uh, the, 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 the most difficult thing is to have the right criteria. Si no, si no piensas bien, no creas bien. If you don't think well, you cannot create well enough. Y la cocina es muy complicado pensar bien. And, and in cooking it's very difficult to, to think in the right way. Porque todo el mundo sabe de cocina. You know why? Because everyone knows about cooking, or everyone thinks they know about cooking. Sobre la física, física de estos señores, la, la, materia de, la materia blanda y todo esto, nadie discute. You know, when you talk to a professor at the physics departments and they talk to you about matter and black holes, no one argues with them. Nadie, eh? Nadie. No one argues with them. Nadie. Who dares to argue with a physics uh, professor at Harvard? Sobre cocina todo el mundo. But cooking, pff, everyone has an opinion. Oh. Everyone knows. Mi, mi, sí, mi, mi tía, mi prima, todos me discuten a mí. His aunt, the cousins, the mother, everyone argues with him about cooking. Sí que haces cosas raras. You know, they will argue with him. Man, you're doing strange things, Ferran. 
is and will tell him. Yo al principio me, me, esto me tocaba, ¿eh? no, me, at, at the very beginning he was very touched by it and even made him think. I'm like, I'm, hasta que me wow. di, hasta que me di cuenta que la, la rara no, lo raro no era la comida, eran mis tías, ¿sabes no? And at the end he realized that uh, what was strange was not his cooking, but his aunts. Decir, con esto quiero decir que no, decir, no puedes partir de la base de hablar co de cocina si de verdad, y no abro broma, entiendes que no hay comida rara, que hay gente rara. So, in order to start a dialogue about cooking, you have to have something very clear. That there is not weird or strange cooking, there is strange people. Al 99% de los japoneses les encanta pescado crudo. You know, to the vast majority of the Japanese people, they love raw fish. Al 99% de los alemanes, no. To the, to, to the 99% of uh, Germans, they don't. Alemanes, sí, sí, sí. El pescado tiene la culpa, eh. And the fish is not responsible for it. <laughs> okay. Bueno. La cocina es un lenguaje. Cooking is a language. No. Si vosotros leéis esto, if you read this, ¿eh? leéis aquí lo que pone, ¿no? Más o menos. A ver. What is this? A ver. I am. ¿No? Ah. ¿Qué pone? No. A ver. It says Barça. B A R. The Catalan Z, which is carrot. A. ¿Eh? Bueno. Barça, which is the diminutive for Barcelona. ¿Ok? Barça. En, en catalán. ¿Entendés? ¿No? Resulta que todo el mundo sabe catalán aquí. What? So everyone knows Catalan here? Because this is in Catalan. Sí, pues en catalán, ¿no? Entonces, <coughs> claro, si ponemos Barça en chino... So if we put Barça in Chinese... ¿Cuánta gente lo sabría? How many people will understand the word in Chinese? Uh, si no conoces chino, ninguno. If you don't know Chinese. Uh, is any Chinese student here that can write in Chinese, Barça? No. Entonces, no. tantos, en, en cada lugar del mundo hay una, una lengua. In every place in the world there is a language. Y una cocina. And a cooking. Es más fácil que en un pueblo perdido de no sé dónde It's, no, no haya una lengua It's probably easier than in a little village lost in the middle of nowhere uh, we, that they will have no language at all. Pero siempre habrá una manera de comer. But probably in that village that maybe has no language, probably they have a way of eating and a, and a, and a culinary history, nuestro, a culinary tradition. Nuestro trabajo, his la, work, la cocina de vanguardia, in the avant-garde cooking, es crear un nuevo lenguaje. It's to create a new language. Para crear un nuevo lenguaje, hace falta un nuevo alfabeto. To create a new language, there you need a new alphabet. Claro, y si creas un nuevo alfabeto, entonces es cuando no te entiende nadie. But then, if you create a new alphabet, then there is where no one understands you. No, no. Porque más o menos si es el mismo alfabeto. Because more or less, if it's the same alphabet around the world. Oh, Barça, sí, tal, más o menos. Catalan, Barça, español, Catalan, Latin, todo. Catalan, Latin, English, Spanish, maybe more or less you are able to understand. Pero si nos Chau. ponen aquí un, un, un dialecto de la India, es que nadie lee nada. But if there we put uh, a dialect of, uh, from India, or we put, you know, uh, Chinese, uh, Chinese uh, letters, no one uh, in this room will understand absolutely anything. Y esto es lo que ha pasado con la cocina de vanguardia. And this is what has happened with the avant-garde cooking movement. ¿Eh? Como es un nuevo alfabeto, because it's a new alphabet, hemos tardado tiempo, tiempo para que la gente nos podamos entender. It's kind of been very, very long to make sure that there is a dialogue between the people that need to understand this new language through this new alphabet. De, para crear este nuevo lenguaje en cocina hace falta nuevas técnicas, nuevos conceptos. So to create this new language in cooking, there we need new techniques and we need new concepts. Nuevos productos. Also, new products. Entonces, <coughs> alguien un día se le ocurrió coger tres huevos y hacer una tortilla. Then one day, someone wake up in the morning, got three eggs, and bumba, they made an omelet. No, creó un, un concepto y una, una elaboración. That moment, 
this person created a new concept, a new elaboration. Como la cocina no está datada. Because uh, cooking really has no a, a timeline of, of years where dishes were created through the history of humankind. No sabemos cuándo fue. We really don't Ma, know the day menos. that this man made the first three-egg omelette. No, que sí. Pues, por ejemplo, sabemos que existen los huevos fritos desde el 1500 y pico porque hay un, un cuadro de Velázquez con lo, haciendo huevos fritos. For example, we know about fried eggs because there is a great painting uh, by Velázquez, with, you can see at the Museo del Prado in Madrid, that was a woman frying eggs in a terracotta casserole from the 1500s. There we know the day that someone was frying eggs. Eh, pero hasta hace 10 años no se ponían, no se databan los platos. But only until recently, and the, maybe around 10 years ago, the, the plates, they never had the year uh, that they were created. La primera fue, vez fue en el año 99. The first time uh, was in 1999. Uh, que lo hicimos en el Bulli. Uh, him, it happened at El Bulli in Rosas, in uh, the north part of Catalonia. Y poco a poco ya es una obligación hoy en día poner los años. And now it's part, part of the creative process every time a dish is created to put the year of creation next to it. Las nuevas generaciones podrán the new generations will be able la, la to study estamos... contemporary and avant-garde cooking today with a timeline that gives them perspective on the creation of the plate and the techniques and etc. Entonces, <coughs> nosotros en el Bulli lo que siempre hemos, int hemos intentado es hacer esta creatividad conceptual. So, uh, at El Bulli, always he's worked very hard creating this conceptual creativity. Crear un concepto, una nueva elaboración que abriera caminos. Um, creating uh, concepts that will help open new ways in the creation process. Gracias a la primera tortilla se han hecho miles de tortillas. Thanks to the first omelette, thousands of other omelettes, they've been created. Sí, sí, ahora si hiciéramos un, un juego. If now we will do a quick game. Y en, os dijera, en un minuto me tenéis que decir una nueva tortilla. In every one of you, in one minute, you have to create in your brain a new omelette. Mentalmente muchos de vosotros haría. Probably the vast majority of you will come up with no. an idea for a new omelette. No. With cheese, with asparagus, with dill, who knows? No. Then, <coughs> vamos a hacer una, 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 like un concepto. Eh? So we're going to do now a new mañana? concept. Que cabe la idea, que idea. Lo que explicaste esta mañana. La tortilla la pueden hacer, pero el concepto es muy difícil. ¿Lo ha usted? Yeah, okay. so, so it's to, to finish what he was trying to tell you. I'm translator, but also remember that the omelette, everyone will come up with one because the concept was already created. But if he will ask you, think about a new concept, probably, probably, very, very, very few of you will be able to come up with a concept on the spot. What he means with that, concepts are the most difficult thing to create. Yes? That was the idea. Vamos a hacer un concepto, una evaluación que se llama esferificación. So he's going to explain you a concept that is called esferification from the word sphere. A sphere, yeah? Esferification. Cuando hablamos de creatividad, when we speak about creativity, en cualquier campo, eh? in, in any field, lo importante no ser el primero. The important thing is really not to be the first one. Lo importante es ser el que conceptualiza. The important thing is that person that is able to conceptualize no. that idea. Por ejemplo, so, nosotros en el año 99, for example, in the year 1999, hicimos gelatina caliente. They made hot gelatin. Sorry, 98. Sorry, 98. ¿Es la gelatina? La gelatina no era ni fría ni caliente. So gelatins until 98, they were no hot or cold. Era gelatina. They were gelatins. Porque era fría. Why? Because gelatins were obvious that they were cold. Period. Entonces, yo, nosotros vimos una cosa que estos 
Aquí en Harvard la he visto miles de veces. So they were able to see something at El Puyi that the people here at Harvard saw millions of times. Los científicos. Uh, you know, but they are scientists. Y que si alguno lo fuera contextualizado sería muy famoso ahora. And if any of these scientists will conceptualize that idea of the hot gelatin, wow, they will be Nobel Prize. Right? Que el, el agar... Sí, 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 sí. O sea, la... Que el agar... Que el agar, agar... Agar agar, which is a kind of a seaweed, aguanta la temperatura hasta 85 grados, 85 90 grados. Agar agar, which is uh, it helps you to make a gelatin, allows you uh, agar agar can hold a temperature up to 85 Celsius degrees. That's very hot. De nosotros lo único que fue dije, ostras, pues si esto esto es una gelatina caliente. And it's very hot and doesn't melt. So you have a gelatin that is 85 Celsius degrees, very very hot. And doesn't melt. It's a hot gelatin. So they look at it and they were like, "Wow, this is a hot gelatin." <laughs> you know, they wow, they will be, I mean, famous. So that was an important moment. That was an immense. That's the idea of a concept, okay? las ideas tampoco, las ideas espectaculares o tal, todo también es muy relativo también. You know, the this spectacular spectacular, showy ideas, you know, it's, it's all relative. Depende. Yeah, uh, depende. Uh, depends. Un huevo frito is very simple. You know, a fried egg is a very simple thing, you will say. Un pastry is very complex. Uh, un pastel es muy complicado. <laughs> un pastel. <laughs> a, a pastry is very complicated. But... Yeah. Pero la importancia es igual. But is the same has the same importance to make a simple fry egg as to make a complicated pasta. Lo que vais a ver, lo que vais a ver ahora es muy simple. What you're going to be seeing right now it's unbelievably simple. Muy muy simple. Very very simple. Okay. Entonces tenemos aquí a Ruben y a Aitor. Um, here we have uh, Ruben and Aitor. Uh, you know, I want to make a point to to say something because this class at Harvard has happened First, because uh, David and Michael and, uh, and the physics department, but it has happened really because this man, for over 30 years, has devoted himself to share every single thing that went through his brain. And believe me, it's a lot of things. <laughs> with the world. And this only I want to tell you because, unfortunately, it's going to be 13 weeks where many chefs are going to be coming. But the heart of this everything we're going to be teaching is him. What I want to tell you, and has to do with these two gentlemen, is because these two gentlemen are with me now in Washington, D.C. Every time I needed help over my 20 years in America after I left El Bulli, always he will be a phone call away. Ferran, I need help. With me and with any other cook around the world. So I only want to tell you, because we are talking about creativity, and we see creativity in the pharmaceutical world, in, in any in any field. And everyone, when they create, they keep the things that they create for themselves. This man has done completely the opposite. Everything he has created, he's open his knowledge to the world. And for that, I really, in front of all of you, uh, I want to praise him because what he has done, besides moving, cooking forward and bringing creativity, is showing that generosity is really what opens doors in the world. And his generosity is shown by sending me some of his best people and now helping me also keep cooking in America and in Washington. So thank you, Ferran, for being so generous. Yeah. <coughs> thank you. Bueno, pues ahora vamos a hacer la verificación. So now we are going to make S verification. Que nació en el año 2003. It born in the year 2003. Aquí tenemos agua. So, um, vamos a ir poco a poco, ¿eh? Yeah. So, uh, let's go slowly, ¿no? Yeah. So, uh, ¿lo explico? ¿Lo explicamos? So, esferification. What esferification is all about? Esferification is to get a liquid that you will submerge in another liquid And the first liquid that you submerge into the new one will end becoming kind of a sphere that has a shell, a very thin layer 
in its exterior. That's its purification. The drop of water in another water bath that allows a chemical reaction, a gelatination, that allows us to make these kind of amazing balls. So here we have Estela Basica. Here is what Ferran calls the basic spherification. And this is what he created in 2003. Basic spherification is what you see here. It's a liquid. Let's say it's water, any flavor you choose. And here we mix an ingredient that is called sodium alginate. From now on, we are going to call it alginate. Alginate is seaweed. You know when you go to the beach and you see seaweed? We make a powder out of the seaweed that we call alginate. And usually it comes from an algae, which are the brown biarities. It's different kinds, one called luminaria. It's many biarities. The important is that it's a powder that comes from seaweed, OK? So the alginate is mixed here. And then this mix of water with the alginate goes into a, a, a water bath that has a powder that is called calcium chloride. Calcium chloride. Forget chloride, calcium. Right? So the liquid with the alginate goes into the liquid, into the water with calcium. Are you with me? So we leave it there for one minute. And what happens is that it starts in the exterior, it starts gelatinizing, creating a shell, almost like the shell of an egg yolk. So take a look what happens. Un momento, espera. La cámara ya está. Sí. No, mira, que está ahí. La cámara, TV. Ya, ya. Yo, I want the world to see. Profesional, eh, profesional, eh. Profesional, eh. So, guys, take a look, because this is fascinating. This was water a minute ago. En el año 2003. In the year 2003. Cuando, ahí en el taller. When he, uh, they were at El Taller, Hicimos esto que vais a ver. And, they, uh, and this happened, right, what you see. No, no. Y este, y se... That was a fascinating moment. Ja. E e Eureka, right? No, no, no. Dijimos, ostras. Oysters, wow. Ja. <coughs> ¿Por qué? Porque estábamos viendo que estábamos delante de algo importante. Uh, you know, he, he was very excited because right in that moment he saw that they were right in front of, of something very important. Pero qué problema, qué problema tenía esto? But you know, this technique was great, allows them to make many things, but this had a little problem. Cuando tú le ponías a, a un producto el alginato, uh, when you will put to a product the alginate, no, depende cuál era el producto, depends what the product was, no, mojaba. Uh, um, uh, uh, the, that product will coagulate, will coagulate very quick and no. in a bad way. Y se podía hacer con muy pocos productos. So, uh, you know, he, he saw that um, with the calcium chloride and the alginate partnership, he couldn't handle every single product. He could only use very few products. Entonces, un año después, so a year later, 2004, they, you know, they went through the thought process about esferification. Junto con Pera Castell. Next to Pera Castell, who is uh, a scientist that works next to Ferran. Que en aquella época estaba en el taller de Barcelona. That at that time uh, he was at El Taller, his great place in Barcelona, back in time. Antes de ir director de, uh, del Departamento Científico de Galicia. Before becoming the director of the scientific department at Alicia Foundation. Que si, que lo del calcio, ¿no? ¿Dónde estaba el calcio? ¿Dónde había el calcio, no? They began looking uh, for other sources and other ingredients uh, to use uh, calcium and substitute the calcium chloride that they were using before. En la leche. Mi, mi, then mi, they saw that in milk. Yogurt. Yogurt. They go, wow, fantástico. Those were products that had calcium. So Entonces, he thought, wow, vamos brilliant, a, vamos great. A, vamos a cambiar. Let's change. Let's change the process completely. Aquí el alginato está aquí. Right now, the alginate was here. El calcio 
And the, the calcium chloride, the calcium was in this water bath here on the left. Aquí el calcio está aquí. Now the product is the one that has the calcium. Y el alginato aquí. And now the water bath is the one that has the alginate. Es fantástico. Bingo. <laughs> Fantastic. So take a look at what happens when he drops ejemplo, this. Esto es maravilloso para enseñar ciencia a los niños. This is fascinating to teach science to kids. Cuando a veces enseñamos, cuando en Alicia enseñan todo esto. When at Alicia Foundation they teach all of this. Es magic. It's magic. Harry Potter. Es mágico. ¿Eh? Harry Potter. ¿Eh? So take a look at what's happening there. Entonces, bueno, dijimos, ah, genial, genial, pero claro, vimos, solo se puede hacer con leche y con láctea. But then they were like, bingo, great, but, ha, huh, hold on a second. We can only make it with yogurt and milk. Ah. Entonces, hicimos todas las versiones posibles. So, they began making different versions, the all around milk and yogurt. Mm, de con queso. With cheese, everything that had kind dijimos, of bueno, calcium dairy components. Entonces, fuimos un poquito más lejos y dijimos, bueno, y si le ponemos calcio... A la agua. And then they tried to go, you know, further uh, up. And they began, he began thinking, wow, why, why we add calcium to water so we don't have to be using any milk-based dairy products? You know, lo hicimos, probamos. And they made it, they tested. Y el calcio era demasiado fuerte. And the calcium was too strong, was not good enough. Y restaba gusto al producto. And was taking away the flavor of the product. And Ferran mm. is always about flavor. Uh, no, desastre. Oh, a disaster. Oh. Y le, le dijimos a Pera. So they uh, established a conversation with the scientists, with Pera Castage. Que tenía que buscar un, un producto alternativo. And you know, he told Pera, Pera, you have to look for another product that we can use in substitute of this uh, calcium chloride. Y descubrimos el glucolactato. And they discover glucolactate. Gluconolactate. Another form of calcium that has almost over 12% content in calcium. Calcium, we're going to call it gluco from now, okay? Gluconolactate, another form of calcium. You find it in cheeses and etc. It's esto, a very common thing. Esto tenía un problema también. The, the, the basic esferification, the first one we showed you, the one they invented, had another problem. Que con el tiempo. That with time, if you will drop the sphere and you will leave it for a long time. Se vuelve gelatina. Can we get the camera right here, sir? Right here. Thank you. That if they will leave it for a long time, take a look what will happen. You know? It's... It's a big, thick ball. It keeps cooking through. The entire thing gelatinizes. It's not liquid in the heart anymore. La, base, la inversa no. But in the, rever, in the inverse spherification, this will never happen. The cooking use will happen in the exterior. The cooking will not keep penetrating inside the sphere. So that one was brilliant. You saw when he cut it, right? Has the skin. And still is liquid inside. But mm. will not keep cooking through. And this was a breakthrough for them. Ah, Because sí. you can keep this one for a day or two uh, and for la production. Gente, la gente me dice, uy, qué complejo. So now people, he shows this and they come to him and tell, and tell him, wow, this is so complex. Yo esto, esto no lo puedo hacer en casa. I cannot do this at home. Muy complejo, ¿no? Very complex. Y Too después, complicated. Y yo digo, tú qué haces en casa también. And, and then he has, uh, answers back, um, what do you cook at home? Biscochos. And he says, genoise, uh, um, uh, you know, uh, puddings. Uh, Oye, el pudding es mucho más difícil que esto, ¿eh? Hey, to make a pudding is much more difficult than to make this. Mucho más, ¿eh? <laughs> a lot more difficult. Uh, entonces, cuando descubrimos el gluconolactato, fue maravilloso. So when they discovered the gluconolactate, That was a breakthrough. That was el, marvelous. El resultado es el mismo. The final product is exactly the same. Es una esfera. It's a sphere. Líquida dentro. That happens to be liquid inside. Esta es el problema que con, con poco, se puede hacer con pocos productos y la, se, el calcio entra dentro. Y the se first genera. one 
had the issue that you could only use very few products and the calcium will cook all the way through. So, ah, not so good. Yes, no. And this one had none of those issues. Yeah, the calcium will never penetrate because in this case it's completely the opposite and will not cook through. And you could keep it for a day okay. or two. Vale. Is that clear? Yeah, right. Yeah? Right. Then, queríamos ir más allá. So, always with Ferran, y we wanted to keep moving forward that idea of spherification. Y al Bulli vino un, un señor que era científico. And, you know, as a gentleman came to El Bulli, happens he was a scientist. Y nos trajo una máquina. No, nos dijo, ostras, yo, yo, yo tengo una máquina que hace cosas parecidas. And the scientist told Ferran, hey, wow, this is great, but I have a machine that does something like this, very similar. Y pues traerla. And he told the scientists, great, bring it on. Era mucho más genial. Era más genial que, que esto. So, that technique was unbelievable. Bueno, de, aquí tenemos eh, el calcio. So, here we have um, uh, the calcium chloride. Esta, eh, es, esta es esferificación básica. So, this one was going back to the beginning, okay? And, understand, and you'll see why later. This was the basic esferification. Tenemos el alginato. That's the alginate, yeah, the seaweed base powder. Y lo mezclamos. And, you know, he, they will mix the alginate with the water. Yeah? Uh, eh, igual, igual exactamente que... que Simple, que water and the alginate. The same way as you saw uh, before. Eh, <coughs> they will blend it to make sure that it's very well incorporated. Colamos. And they will, uh, this will go through a sheaf to make sure that uh, the water is, is, is clear and transparent and clean of any impurities. And there you have the water. Remember this moment, y the water la, with the alginate. Okay? La máquina. So the water with the alginate goes right into this little um, kind of bottle. Is that okay? And the machine you see there, it's a machine to encapsulate. Yeah. With this machine, they do encapsulations, which more or less is to put a liquid inside another liquid. Brilliant, right? So there they put olive oil. Spanish, Spanish olive oil. Hey. I no, forgot. No, no. Hey. Yeah. Always a Spanish. No, no, si no, no sale. If you don't do it with the Spanish olive oil, it doesn't work. <laughs> and you add seven atmospheres of pressure, and there what you see in this water bath is the water with the um, calcium chloride, okay? There we have a little magnet in the bottom. And take a look what's gonna happen right now. Inside that machine, the encapsulation is happening. And what's happening is that the olive oil is going through the machine, and the olive oil drop brings with it a very thin layer of the water with the alginate. Are you with me? So in the very outside is the water with the alginate. And in the moment that the droplets go into the water bath with the calcium chloride, boom, in one second, cooks. Like the basic spherification you saw at the beginning. So what you have there is a gelatinized exterior surrounding the drop of olive oil that is hard in the outside, thanks to the alginate, but is still liquid like olive oil is in the heart. ¿Cuál es el problema de esta esferificación? What's the problem of this esferification? Que se queda gelatina, ¿no? Uh, of the basic one we showed you at the beginning, that if you right. keep cooking, becomes hard, right? Gelatinizes. Right. That's not what Pero we si, want. Pero si es grasa, ¿no? But the great thing is that if you use the basic right. technique right. Right. with a fat, right. Right. nothing happens because the fat cannot gelatinize. Y con, con esto hacíamos el caviar de aceite de oliva. And with this, they created the caviar of olive oil from Spain. Oh. Aquí, esto es una primicia. Uh, what uh, you are seeing here is news, first time Porque he's este showing this to anyone. Es el primer eh, eh, aceite, hay que hablar de aceite comercial, porque de aquí dos meses ya va a haber mano comercial. Because in two months, this Olive oil caviar is going to be commercial and it's mm -hmm. going to be 
available in establishments near you. Mm -hmm. Well, I don't know in America yet, but in the States, uh, in, in Spain and in Europe. Bueno, entonces, vale, pero... ¿Qué pasa? Que yo ya estaba harto de las esferas. But what happened? Spheres, spheres, spheres. He got tired of spheres. No, no, no. Es que claro, están todas esferas, ¿sabes? No, todo redondo. Because spheres, everything around, everything like a ball, spheres, man. Entonces le dije, le quiero dar formas. So, he began going through the thought process. Hey, I want to give to this spherification a new form. Oh, le, y estuvimos dándole muchas, vuelt muchas vueltas. When they went through the thought process and y, they went around and around. Y no, y no salía ninguna. And nothing no, happened. No sabíamos cómo hacerlo. They didn't know how to make it happen. Ahora cuando lo veréis, dice, es muy sencillo. But now he's going to show you and then you're going to say, wow, that's a piece of cake. No, bueno, dale. But it took time to make this happen. Uh, eh, es importante el concepto, porque yo sé que, como sabemos, hay cierta polémica con el tema del de, concepto de natural. You know, uh, it's very important to understand something, because lately it's been controversy on the meaning of what's natural and what's not natural, right? En una, una, en una universidad este, este, este discurso es mucho más fácil. In a university environment, uh, this uh, talk about natural and unnatural is a lot easier. No, pero relativamente, ¿eh? Well, maybe not, relative. Para, para, uh, maybe. para la gente de ciencia, no. For the people of science, it's very easy to uh -huh. have a, a talk, a dialogue about what's uh -huh. natural and what's not. Y vamos a preguntar, ¿usted se comía una lubina con cloro sódico? Uh, uh, you know, let's say we ask you, hey, uh, will you eat a, a, a red snapper with uh, a sodium uh, chloride? No. And people will tell you, me? A no, fish no, with sodium chloride? No, 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 no way, no. Jose, no way. No, 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 no. Químico, Are you crazy? Químico, químico. It, oh, this is chemistry. Oh, no, I don't no, want no. chemistry cooking. If they say, you una lubina de sal? But if they tell you, um, do you want a red snapper baking salt? Big. Then you will say, fantastico, me, wow, me, yes, me, this me is delicious. Very natural. Y le pregunta, ¿y cuál es la diferencia? And, and then you will ask, oh, what's the difference? No sé. I don't know. No hay diferencia, es lo mismo. It's no different because it's the same thing. Salt equals sodium chloride. Esto parece muy simple. This seems simple. Pero esto es culpable de tanta manipulación que hay con el tema de la comida. But y something la salud. so simple is where is responsible for kind of all this controversy about using all these ingredients se in cooking today. Se manipula la sociedad porque la sociedad no, está, no tiene educación. Society is manipulated because society doesn't have enough education about food products. Confunde lo bueno con lo sano. Uh, they, they, uh, they, uh, uh, they, um, uh, they confuse themselves uh, between uh, good and healthy. Uh -huh. Confunden lo natural con lo no natural. They also confuse natural with non-natural. Porque no hay educación. ¿Por qué qué? No hay una educación sobre esto. Because there is not education about these simple issues. ¿Habría alguna, alguna facultad en Harvard que explique esto? ¿Ahora existe? Uh, it's, it's, uh, it's any department, it's any, any department at Harvard that will, that explains Es, es very this. simple, ¿eh? It's very simple, right? No. No. No, 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 no. no es muy serio. Uh, that's very serious. Porque es una continua manipulación. Because it's a total manipulation by... Ayer, en España... In Spain. En Cataluña, desde Alicia, tenemos obsesión... In Catalonia, at the Alicia Foundation... Que la, que la educación entre de, en los pequeños they hasta are los mayores... To make, sure, to make sure that education will, will get to the young ones, to the youngsters, to the two, three-year-old children. Para que no se manipule. To make sure that, that they, they understand, to make sure that no one manipulates their brains. Y tú puedas decidir. Uh, and then you can make a decision on your own by having the right education, the right knowledge. No, pero te tienen que explicar que el azúcar blanco. But they have to explain you that white sugar tiene un proceso químico, físico increíble. Has a chemical, physical process that is unbelievable. Pero es que esto no es malo. But you know, that's okay, not bad. 
El vino tiene un proceso químico físico increíble. Wine has also a chemical physical process. ¿No? Nothing happens. ¿Qué tiene que ver? ¿No? Yo oigo, a mí me encanta el producto natural. You know, lately you hear people, oh, I love the natural products. Y a mí, ¿eh? And to him too. Pero ¿qué tiene que ver el vino con la uva? But you know what a grape has to do with the, the wine. Parece nada. Because at the end of the day, grape and wine, they are two completely different things. Pruebas la uva. You y, can eat the grape. Y pruebas el vino y dices, bueno, es que no sé. No and you nada. drink the wine and you ni say. Ni en el gusto, ni en el color, in ni the en color, la textura. In, in the color, in the texture, in the taste. ¿Qué se parece una oliva al aceite? No. What, what, what uh, an olive has, what resemblance has with olive oil. Esto es muy, muy importante. Muy importante. It's very important to understand that an olive, an olive oil in this case, you que entre have, en las escuelas. It's very important that this conversation gets to the schools. Si no, eh, está explicando antes toda, no, toda la reforma sanitaria que se quiere hacer en Estados Unidos. If not, all this health reform that is uh, happening uh, is been happening in the United States. Over the o en España o en cualquier país del mundo. Or in mundo. Spain or in any country around the world. No sirve para nada. Uh, you know, has uh, no meaning. Will will be uh, uh, will be an effort that will go to waste. Y por esto es tan 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 importante, porque es un tema económico tan 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 importante. And that's why it's so important because it's going to be a very important um, economic kind of issue. El, el los miles de millones de dólares que cuesta la obesidad. The and the hundreds of thousands, the millions of dollars that obesity is going to be costing to the countries of the world. Con educación serían un 10%. With the right education, will drop dramatically in a huge percentage. Es por esto es tan importante. That's why education is going to be so important. Es por esto, los cocineros, de una manera muy humilde, that's why, in a very humble way, cooks. Somos tan importantes para esto. That's why cooks. That's why we are so important to establish this conversation and this conversation. Porque cuando decimos, hablamos de cocina, la gente más o menos. Nos, nos oye. Because usually when we speak about cooking, people listen to us, listen to the cooks. ¿No? No, estaba, espera, estaba esperando para que pusieran el vídeo, ¿eh? I mean, he was explaining all of this to you because we were making time until the video was working. <laughs> Entonces, digo, voy a decir... <laughs> Any other issue? <laughs> Vamos a hacer un pesto. They're going to make a pesto. Everyone understands pesto out of basil. ¿Eh? So there we have pine nuts, there we have uh, parmesan. Aceite. Olive oil from Spain. The gluconolatate, uh, the calcium. Aquí la idea era hacer un salt. Here the idea was to make a ravioli. Hacer un ravioli que fuera la salsa. Here the idea was, to, this is walnut, a praline walnut, walnuts that are blended. Here the idea was to make a ravioli that its own ravioli becomes the sauce. Shantam gan, okay, shantam gan, which is a great gan that comes from uh, a bacteria that processes sucrose and sugar and makes shantam gan. Great product. Gelatina. And gelatin sheets, okay, the gelatin sheets we've been using for decades. So he puts all the ingredients, the praline walnuts, the basil, The peanut, salt, the olive oil. Añadimos la gelatina. So now they add the gelatin, okay? Because the, you see the substance is liquid. When you add the gelatin and you put it in the refrigerator. La podemos añadir aquí, okay? Que fuera aquí la gelatina. So they put it in a tray like this and goes into the refrigerator until, thanks to the gelatin, thickens, right? Like if you were making jello. Cortamos los raviolis. They cut uh, the raviolis. Vamos a calentar al vapor. And then he's going to no. drop them into this uh, water bath with the alginate, okay? And take a look what is going to happen. A very thin layer, okay, of the alginate is going to attach to these square, uh, these triangle raviolis. 
and then he's going to steam them in steam and he's going to put them and take a look what happens the alginate runs the bacillus inside and the liquid ravioli breaks becoming the ravioli its own sauce <laughs> Entonces, la esferificación sirve para hacer un lenguaje. So, esferification helps you to create a language. Como si aquí hubiera una ensalada. The same as if next to it, right here, we will have a green salad. La, se puede hacer este lenguaje, se puede hablar bien o se puede hablar mal. So, there you have the language, esferification, and you can speak this language well, or maybe you will speak this language badly. Y, y el de aquí también. And the salad, the same. <coughs> you can speak the salad language well, or you can speak the salad language badly. Es que todas las, todas las son buenas. Or happens that every single salad around the world is a good salad. No. No. <laughs> y, y si ponemos las pizzas... <laughs> and if he puts here a pizza... Es más fácil encontrar esferificación buena que una pizza buena. It's probably easier today to find a good esferificación than a good pizza. Entonces, lo digo porque siempre la crítica... And he wants to mention this because always is the criticism going contra, around. Contra la cocina, cocina de vanguardia. Uh, when we talk about avant-garde cooking. Ah, sí, José Andrés, fantástico, fantástico. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, great, this guy, uh, great. Pero los, uh, los chicos jóvenes no... Hay mucha gente que lo hace mal. But they always say, yeah, uh, Ferran Adria or José Andrés is great, but this youngster, oh, he's terrible on this avant-garde cooking movement. Como en cualquier otro tipo de cocina. Maybe yes, but like in any other kind of cooking. In la, the traditional as well as in the avant-garde. La diferencia es que esto the difference is that this hace avanzar. helps you to move forward. Y hay que dejar a los jóvenes que se equivoquen. And we, ne we, we, we need to let the youngsters, the young cooks, to be wrong. It's good to be wrong. Si no se equivocan, no, vamos a, no, no se va a quedar nada. You know, if you are not wrong, you will never risk, and so you will never ever create anything. Y en, sobre todo en América, el país ¿no? donde esto es una filosofía. And in America, where, where this approach is almost a philosophy. ¿no? ¿no? Hay que, hay que en, la, en la cocina también tiene que ser así. In the cooking also has to be like that. Uh -huh. Entonces, thank you very much. And thank you very much. Okay, so now we have a little bit of time for a few questions. It's a little bit late, but we should allow a couple questions. And there are some people roving around with microphones, I believe. I appreciate. Aprecia. Can you hear me? I appreciate the uh, flavor of this type of cooking. But what about the texture of, say, chewing a carrot or biting a celery? Doesn't this microgastronomy lose that aspect of cooking and eating? Estamos en esta cocina, pero pero el morder una una zanahoria, el morder natural, el morder el morder un pedazo de apio rico. No no está esto un poco. No, pero es que es que esto es otra es una equivocación de de cuando se habla de de este tipo de cocina que parece que solo se haga esto. You know we, uh, what's happened is that when we talk about this kind of cooking. It seems that we only do this, and we only put these kind of things in the plate. And this is something completely wrong. Uh, in his restaurant, in my restaurant, in any restaurant, this is a science class today. And we are sh showing you the science. But this is wrong, because we put vegetables and fruits no. and in the plate, too. No. What, what is the tema? Que what happens? Si yo vengo a explicar cocina. Because if he comes to explain cooking. Y esto es una zanahoria. And this is a carrot. No sé qué puedo explicar. Uh, he doesn't know what he's going to explain to you. Que la coma. He's going to tell you. Here you have, you can eat it. <laughs> it's, it's, it's no. Great. Entonces, es verdad que no hay que monopolizar. 
you know what, this cannot be a monopoly on, on this talk. Ninguna, ni, ninguna técnica ni ninguna evaluación. Lo importante es el, el, lo importante es la variedad, ¿no? Uh, what is important is the variety. I mean, now avant-garde cooking is now as, as verification. This is one thing of thousands of techniques uh, we use. Okay. Y por ejemplo, si, si, es súper importante. Si yo hiciera un, o sea, croquetas, si hiciera lo mismo con cro croquetas. Imagine that for a second we are making this, the same elaboration with croquetas, which is a fried bechamel base, very no. traditional in Spain, no, kind no, of fritter, okay? No, no está en el croquetas, no, con once, lo mismo. Same thing. No. Y si hiciéramos sobre huevos, lo mismo. And if he will do the same about eggs, will be the same. He'll we'll give you a talk about... Un huevo no come mucho, no, no... no. With one egg, you know. No. Uh, an egg. Good. Okay. So, so I'd like to propose we take one more question. It turns out just so that... that um, so the, the Dom Beer Company, which is a Spanish beer company with which Ferran... Um, developed a beer has donated beer, which is outside that door um, right now. And so, so um, at Harvard, you stop the talk for drinking. You wouldn't believe it, but I. But there's time for one more question. There are roving people with microphones. Yeah. Take it. I like Harvard. Oh, oh, book signing. Oh, I see. Okay, book signing. One more. Yeah. Um, has there ever been a perfect ing ingredient that you felt should never be manipulated because nature was enough? ¿Te has encontrado con un ingrediente que era tan perfecto naturalmente que pensaste que ya no tenía ma manipulación? Mucho. Depende de la pregunta. Yeah, 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 yes. Uh, get ready for the answer. I'm telling you now. Dile. Voy a tener que por la mañana. Imagine for a second. We are right now in the morning. Te levantas por la mañana. You wake up in the morning. Solo. Sunny day, beautiful. Solo, eh? Ah, alone. Solo, solo. Ah, no sunny. Sunny, but alone. <risa> eh, entonces, claro, ¿qué es lo que te va a quedar bien por la mañana? So, you know, what is going to be good in the morning? Lo más, lo más normal siempre es ir en el cantoncillo. You know, if you are... A home, you are alone, you're going to be in underwear. Claro. Well, no. You are alone at home, you're happy. Pasan las dos horas. Then two hours later. Y vas a, vas a ir, vendrás a estudiar a Harvard. You know, you will have to come to study to Harvard. Entonces dices, bueno, que voy en calzoncillos. So you will ask yourself, huh, I cannot go in underwear to Harvard. Me parece que no, no, no cuadra. It's not very logical that you will do that. No. Yeah? Te vas a vestir para venir a estudiar. You're going to dress the right way to come to study to Harvard. No vendas con un frac. You are not going to come with a chaque, with a, a frac, with a no. black tie, right? Llegado por la tarde. In the afternoon, has five quedado o'clock. Con tu compañero, con tu compañera. You know, you, you have a date with your friend, your y, girlfriend. Y resulta que tienes que estar un poco romántico. You know, you want a romantic moment. No. Y vas a, vas a volver a tu casa. You are, you're going to go back to your home. Y te vas a poner bien guapo. You're going to dress beautifully. Te pondrás colonia. You're going to put some cologne, probably. No, te pondrás. OK. You know, you'll come, you're, well, whatever. No. Yeah. Entonces, volverás. Then, a, you go back. A las 12, a casa. At 12 uh, uh, a.m. in the morning already. Y hagamos ciencia ficción. And let's think in the science fiction way. Y que la colonia ha funcionado. And imagine for a second that the colon has work. It's magic. With your girlfriend. Eh, Llegarás a casa, claro. ¿Cómo te vas a poner? ¿No? That you are home and... ¿Cómo se va a vestir? Sí. And eh, para you la are cama, home. Para la cama. And you're ready to go to bed. Your lucky night and... Mm. No, How are you going to dress? No creo que se ponga pijama. I don't think you're going to put your pajamas. Your, your, okay. Right? Pues, ah, cuando, yes. cuando coges un pescado... Oh yeah, oh yeah. I don't know if he understood my question. When you get... <laughs> <laughs> so keep with me, okay? This is... We are going somewhere with this. So... 
I'm a terrible translator. So here, okay, you get the fish. A real, a real fish, okay? Te va a pasar lo mismo. The same thing is going to happen to you. <laughs> puedes, puedes cogerlo entero. You can grab the fish whole. En el grill. In the grill. Lo puedes filetear. You can fillet the whole fish. Puedes hacer una, un pastel de estos que... You can make a fish cake. ¿No? Puedes hacer lo que quieras. You can do whatever you want. Depende. Depends. De, del momento. Of the moment. Del lugar. Of the place. Y de la compañía. And of the company. Very good. So that that seems like an excellent place upon which to stop um, this conversation between science and cooking. So we're grateful to all three of you for making the time to come and spend with us. All right. All right.